Good morning. My name is Rafael Espinal, and I'm the chair of the Committee on Consumer Affairs and Business Licensing. I'm joined today by my colleagues on the committee. We have Peter Koo from Queens, and uh, the sponsor of this bill, we have Richard Torres from the Bronx, who have joined us as well. Today, the committee will be hearing testimony on two pieces of legislation. Intro Bill Number 1023, sponsored by Councilmember Cabrera, in relation to requiring signage at cashless retail establishments, and intro, and intro Bill Number 1281 from Councilmember Torres, which will prohibit retail establishments from refusing to accept payment in cash. Both of these bills draw attention to some of the in its unintended consequences of new cashless technologies and highlight that we need thoughtful solutions to alleviate any negative effects. Cashless transactions can be beneficial for businesses. Eliminating cash from the premises removes the incentive for robbery, and store owners don't have to worry about having change for customers' transactions or making deposits at day's end. Businesses also report that car transactions happen faster. That means less wait times for customers who appreciate speed and efficiency. Both the bills we are hearing today will still permit this technology, technology to be utilized. However, they have been introduced in order to mitigate some of the unintended negative consequences that flow on from a policy that relies exclusively on cashless payments. In a modern financial hub like New York City, it might be easy to assume that everyone has access to the banking facilities and technology that allow cashless transactions. Unfortunately, however, this is not the case. Across the city, there are large populations who are disconnected from the formal banking institutions. In 2013, close to 12% of the city's population were completely unbanked. Additionally, more than 25% of the population were underbanked, meaning that, that meaning that they relied on services such as payday loans or check cashing facilities rather than banks. These households may have a savings or checking account, but in most cases, the fees or overdraft fines make them too cost prohibitive to use regularly. The share of unbanked and underbanked households is also closely linked to poverty rates. According to a 2015 report, the boroughs with the highest percentages of unbanked and underbanked households were the Bronx and Brooklyn. Both of these boroughs had rates way above the national, state, and city rates, and both also have high levels of poverty. In terms of neighborhoods, in my district in Brownsville, which falls partly in, in my district, 28% of households had no bank account in 2015. They also had a 33% poverty rate. In addition to creating barriers for poorer communities, establishments that solely limit transactions to cashless purchases may also impact Im immigrant communities and survivors of domestic violence. Both populations face specific challenges when opening bank accounts, whether that be a lack of documents or identifying information, language barriers, or safety fears. It's easy to get swept up in the promise of technological advancements, especially when they move at such a breakneck speed, lights, Going yes. All right. <laughs> Saving energy for the environment. Uh, it's easy to get swept up in the promise of. T I haven't. I haven't uh, memorized this, so I need to like. Sorry, guys. <laughs> it's easy to get swept up in the promise of technological advancements, especially when they move at such breakneck speed. However, digital transactions are vulnerable to data tracking, identification theft, and hacking, and they raise issues about customer privacy. Cashless technology clearly brings important benefits to businesses and to the customers who are able to make use of it. And while it can seem, while it can seem like counterintuitive to challenge innovations and streamline process and make businesses more efficient, it is important to ensure that these changes do not cause unintended harm. When attitudes towards cash money equate it with being dirty, antiquated, or unsophisticated, we risk stigmatizing the communities who rely on it. According to one author, cash is still the most egalitarian system of payment in the US and we want to make sure that people who have no other form of legal tender can fully make use of it. If not, we risk segregating customers and perpetuating the divide between the haves and have-nots. We therefore look forward to feedback from a range of witnesses today and hearing about how we can balance the needs of business with that of all their customers. Before we begin, I would like to invite uh, the bill sponsor to make a statement. Richie. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's, it's an honor to be here with you and my colleagues, you know, intro 1281 forces us to grapple with a simple question. Right? What does a cashless economy mean for New Yorkers who have faced historically rooted barriers to accessing credit and debit? Right? The history of redlining, the history of financial racism in America is well documented. Right? Imagine if you're a New Yorker who has no documentation 
or no permanent address, or no credit history, or an abysmal credit history, or you live in a neighborhood where there are no traditional banking options, only predatory finance, or you fall victim to fees when attempting to purchase a prepaid card. Right? Given the sheer prevalence of underbanking and poverty in New York City, I worry deeply about the cashless economy and the real world exclusionary effect it will likely have on the most vulnerable New Yorkers. When you open a dollar bill, it reads, this note is legal tender for all debts, public and private. Right? Those words remind us that cash is the universal currency. It's the great equalizer. Not everyone has access to debit or credit, but every one of us has access to cash. Now, there are a whole host of reasons you might prefer cash. Some people, especially senior citizens, prefer cash because it's their most familiar and habitual mode of payment. Some prefer cash because it protects their privacy. It does not involve the dissemination of private data that then can be sold to a third party for the purpose of profit. And as all of you know, there's been a growing backlash against the commercialization of personal data. Some prefer cash because it facilitates fiscal restraint. You know, research has shown that we exercise far less spending restraint when using credit and debit than when using cash whose weight we can feel in our pockets. So if you are a New Yorker who lives paycheck to paycheck for whom every dollar counts, then the stakes of spending restraint are far higher for you and the benefits of cash are far clearer. Now I, for one, rely on electronic payments. I use debits for almost all of my transactions. But that should be a choice that I make freely as a consumer, not a requirement imposed on me by a business. And I want to be clear about what my position is. I am not proposing that we stifle technological innovation or resist the digitization of the economy. I recognize the economy will become more digitized, not less. All I'm claiming, all I'm asserting, is that cashless payment should be one option among many. It should never be the sole option. Consumers should have choice, should have the power to choose cash as their preferred method of payment. So as far as I'm concerned, the purpose of the bill is not to inhibit technological progress. It is to balance technological progress with equity, privacy, and consumer choice. Uh, with that said, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Richie. I just want to acknowledge that we've been joined by Karen Calhouis from Queens and Brad Lander from Brooklyn. Uh, with that said, I want to call up the first panel. We have Casey Adams, the Director of City Legislative Affairs for the New York City Department of Consumer Affairs. And we have uh, Kelly Minaya from the Consumer Affairs as well. Uh, can you please raise your right hand? Uh, do you promise to be truthful to the best of your knowledge in the statements you make and the questions you answer? I do. Thank you. You may begin. Good morning, Chairman Espinal and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Casey Adams, and I'm the Director of City Legislative Affairs for the New York City Department of Consumer Affairs, uh, and I'm joined by our Chief of Staff, Kenny Manaya. I would like to thank the committee for the opportunity to testify today on behalf of DCA Commissioner Laura Lay Salas regarding introductions 1023-2018 and 1281-2018 related to cashless payment policies at retail and food service establishments. DCA's mission is to protect and enhance the daily economic lives of New Yorkers to create thriving communities. As part of this mission, DCA houses the Office of Financial Empowerment, which assists New Yorkers with low and moderate incomes by developing and offering innovative programs and services to increase access to high quality, low cost financial education and counseling, safe and affordable mainstream banking, and access to income boosting tax credits and savings. OFE works to educate, empower, and protect New Yorkers and their communities so that they can improve their financial health and assets. Individuals who lack access to basic financial tools like a checking or savings account or who are forced to rely on alternative financial services like check cashers face significant challenges in managing and improving their financial health, which I think Councilmember Torres referred to earlier. These individuals may have a harder time building savings and assets or, as the bills before this committee recognize, even purchasing basic goods or services at businesses that implement cashless payment policies. Barriers like these can make it harder for some to participate fully in the vibrant local economy that has made our city an engine for opportunity for so many New Yorkers. DCA is strongly committed to expanding financial access for all New Yorkers. 
In 2015, DCA commissioned the Urban Institute to examine how many New Yorkers are unbanked or underbanked and provide a snapshot of which communities are most affected by lack of financial access. That study found that roughly one in every nine New York City households does not have access to a bank account at all. They're unbanked. More than one in four New York City households are underbanked, meaning that they have a checking or savings account but still rely on some place other than a bank to cash a check, purchase a money order, transfer money internationally, or complete some other type of financial service. In total, roughly one million New York City households are considered underbanked or unbanked. The study also found that these households are not evenly distributed across our city. Compared to New York City as a whole, Bronx households were more than twice as likely to be unbanked, with 21.8% reporting that they did not have a bank account against 11.7% for New York City overall. Household neighborhoods in the Bronx and Brooklyn consistently exhibited the highest rates of lack of financial access. In fact, a 2008 OFE study found that New Yorkers in just two neighborhoods, Melrose in the Bronx and Jamaica in Queens, spent approximately $19 million in check cashing fees annually. Across the city, New Yorkers spend $225 million in check cashing fees every year. Alternative financial services firms like check cashers extract huge sums of money from our hardest working New Yorkers, causing substantial harm to their financial health. In a separate study also commissioned by DCA, the Urban Institute examined data about how New Yorkers themselves feel about their own financial security. This study found that perceived financial insecurity was similarly concentrated in certain parts of the city. For example, 36.4% of Bronx residents reported feeling financially unsatisfied, several points higher than the national rate of 31.9%, while only 22.3% of Staten Island residents felt the same way. All of this research underscores how important OFE's work to promote financial inclusion and expand access to safe and affordable financial products is to New Yorkers. It is absolutely critical that the city take a lead role in helping our residents achieve financial health, connecting them to secure, quality banking products, and reducing their need to rely on cash, and thus reduce the tremendous negative impact of check cashing and other similar alternative financial services establishments. The de Blasio administration believes that it is critically important to keep our focus on promoting financial inclusion, expanding access to safe and reliable financial products, and protecting consumers from predatory and deceptive financial practices. The core of DCA's work in this area is rooted in OFE's financial empowerment centers, the first of which opened in the Bronx in 2008. Today, there are more than 20 financial empowerment centers across the five boroughs, providing free, confidential, one-on-one -on -one counseling with professional financial counselors who can help New Yorkers open a bank account, tackle debt, improve credit, and save and plan for a stable financial future. Since the creation of financial empowerment centers, OFE has conducted over 100,000 financial counseling sessions, helping over 52,000 New Yorkers improve their financial health, reduce their debt by a collective $65 million, and increase their savings by a collective $5.1 million. OFE has also helped New Yorkers file more than 1 million tax returns for free, helping clients to claim refund boosting tax credits and saving $150 million in tax preparation fees. Finally, OFE has helped New Yorkers open more than 30,000 bank and credit union accounts through our financial counseling and coaching programs, the IDMIC program, and other programs promoting banking access. Cashless retail and food services businesses are a relatively new phenomenon in New York City. A few years ago, businesses that opted not to accept cash for payment might have been considered unusual. But today, ubiquitous New York City restaurants like Dig In, Dos Toros, and Sweet Green have gone cashless. According to the New York Times, writing back in 2017, cashless is fast on its way to becoming normal. The emergence and growth of cashless businesses has raised questions about the impact that these policies have on financial inclusivity, particularly for communities with significant unbanked and underbanked population. Recent research supports the idea that the way consumers pay for goods and services is changing. According to Gallup, Americans today use cash less frequently than they did five years ago, and a report by the Federal Reserve System found that consumer preference for credit cards has increased in common years, in, in recent years. That report also found that debit and credit cards are now the most commonly used means of payment, while cash continues to be widely and frequently used by consumers. In 2017, debit and credit cards were the payment method for 48% of all purchases, with cash accounting for 30% of purchases. 
However, cash continues to account for nearly half of transactions for households making under $25,000 annually. Proponents of cashless payment policies cite purported benefits like streamlining checkout processes, freeing up employee time spent on counting, managing, and securing cash, and reducing the risk of theft associated with managing and transporting cash. One New York City restaurateur estimated that accepting cash would force him to increase prices at least 10%. Credit card companies like Visa, which we should remember collect processing fees from merchants who accept their cards from consumers, have even encouraged businesses to explore going cashless by offering assistance to upgrade payment technology and other incentives. Concerns about cashless payment policies have focused on the potential to exclude unbanked households. Critics have pointed out that consumers without bank accounts will be unable to purchase goods and services from cashless businesses, presenting new barriers to full participation in the local economy. Others have argued that basic service industries have an obligation to be ex inclusionary and accessible to everyone, which they argue should include accepting cash. Critics have also noted that households of color may be disproportionately affected by cashless payment policies because they are more likely to lack access to a bank account. Responding to these concerns, some jurisdictions have considered or implemented prohibitions on cashless payment policies. Massachusetts law has required retail establishments offering goods and services to accept cash since 1978, and New Jersey, Chicago, Philadelphia, and Washington, D.C. have all considered similar bills. According to the Federal Reserve, there is no federal statute mandating that a private business, a person, or an organization must accept currency or coins as payments for goods or services. Private businesses are free to develop their own policies on whether to accept cash under current law. Local law does not currently prohibit businesses from adopting cashless payment policies. However, DCA's position is and has been that if a business chooses to adopt such a policy, it should cl clearly disclose those restrictions on payment options to consumers. I will now turn to the bills before the committee today, which represent differing responses to the emergence of cashless businesses. Intro 1023 would require retail establishments that do not accept payment in cash from consumers to clearly post signage informing consumers of their cashless payment policy at all consumer entrances or adjacent to cashiers or payment kiosks. Violations would be punishable by civil penalties of $25 to $250. Intro 1281 would prohibit retail and food service establishments from adopting policies in which they refuse to accept payment in cash from consumers. And violations for that law would be punishable by civil penalties of $250 to $500. DCA believes that the city should focus its efforts on promoting financial inclusion by connecting unbanked and underbanked New Yorkers to safe and affordable financial products. For these New Yorkers, the financial challenges go further and deeper than an inability to use cash to purchase goods and services at retail. Prohibiting these businesses from transitioning to cashless payments might treat one symptom of financial inclusion, but it would not remedy the cause lack of access to payment options other than cash. DCA believes that in an increasingly cashless world, helping New Yorkers to get access to a bank account and other financial tools to help them build a secure financial future must be the most important priority. That is why we are so proud of the exemplary work done by OFB and the concrete results that those initiatives have achieved for New Yorkers. We hope the council will remain a strong partner as we continue to pursue those goals. At the same time, OFE's research and experience suggest that more payment options are generally better for low and moderate income New Yorkers. For that reason, DCA supports a policy that promotes financial inclusion and access by requiring businesses to accept cash. While we share the inclusionary goals embodied in Intro 1281, we also believe that any such policy should be responsive to the real world concerns and experiences of consumers, workers, and businesses affected by evolving payment options and business practices. We look forward to working with the council to address these and other issues through the legislative process. DCA commends the council for holding this hearing, which we think is part of an important and ongoing dialogue about cashless payment policies and the evolution of other payment options in New York City. The de Palacio administration is firmly committed to pursuing policies that protect and promote the financial health of low and moderate income New Yorkers, particularly those New Yorkers who are part of vulnerable communities. We are always eager to work with the council to encourage businesses to help make our economy fully accessible and inclusive of all New Yorkers. DCA looks forward to hearing from New Yorkers who have interacted with cashless establishments, businesses who have adopted or are considering adopting cashless payment policies, and advocates, experts, and organizations that focus on promoting financial inclusion. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today, and I'm now happy to answer the committee's questions.
I also want to acknowledge that we've been joined by Margaret Chin from Manhattan. Uh, I would like to defer to Richie to ask a few questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, it seems to me that we're on the same page. We agree on the diagnosis that underbanking is a widespread reality in New York City. There's real financial exclusion. That financial exclusion has historical roots. Um, but it's uh, I'm, I'm, I'm reading your testimony to suggest that you're supportive of the bill, but I'm not clear. Are you fully supportive of the bill? We certainly share the policy outcome, and I think we are on the same right. page about both the uh, the disease and, and the symptom here. Yeah. Um, but do we agree on the prescription? I think we do agree on the prescription. Okay. I think we look forward to working with you through the legislative process to make sure that there aren't un unintended consequences and that whatever policy uh, ends up being adopted by the council uh, is responsive to the concerns of of course, unbanked and underbanked New Yorkers, those who choose to rely on cash, but also consumers, workers, and businesses. So what, what are those concerns? I think that there are certain types of situations where a business may have a good reason for right. restricting the type of cash that is accepted. So a great example of this is a business that is concerned about accepting high denomination bills, like $100 bills, because they believe that that puts their business and their workers at greater but risk. We're not mandating operating. the acceptance of high denomination bills. We're mandating the acceptance of cash in general, right? Well, we, uh, the bill as it's written now is quite broad, and I think it sounds like we share the goal to make sure that those types of situations don't present a challenge here, so we look forward to making sure that that's uh, reflected in the text of the bill that ends up being adopted. Okay, any other concerns? Is that the only concern you have? I Hi. think we, uh, we look forward to hearing more from the public about concerns that they have and from the businesses because we recognize that this is a situation where businesses right now get to shape the policies in terms of how they accept cash or don't accept cash. Uh, so we are not uh, in a position to say that we know every situation that could come up and should be accounted for by this policy. So we're supportive of the policy goal. We look forward to getting more information from the people who are on the ground um, doing these things in the community and uh, making sure that the policy takes account of those. And so it sounds like the only concern that DCA has at the moment is the high denomination bills and you're waiting to hear more concerns from those who testify at the hearing. Council member, I think what we're saying is that we don't believe that we have all of the information right. you, to- we, None of us have all the information. Right. None of us can contemplate every situation or scenario Absolutely. that arises from our legislation, right? But mm -hmm. at the moment, it seems like your only concern is mandating the acceptance of, of all bills, no matter the dollar amount, is that- that I wouldn't say that's not accurate because I think, again, we're leaving the door open to okay. hearing more from people who have more direct experience here. High denomination bills are just one example that's very <laughs> common for these types of businesses. The other concern, of course, would be someone who wants to come in and pay with all pennies, for example. And this is so the, the, the point that we are making is that we share your policy goal. We believe that businesses should accept cash, that they shouldn't send the message to underbanked and unbanked New Yorkers that they um, can't access goods or services at those businesses. We're also saying that the businesses who actually accept cash or don't accept cash and work with consumers every day and the workers who are asked to handle that cash in those businesses may have concerns of which we're not yet aware. And we'd like to make sure that those are heard, which I'm sure they will be today, and to work with you to make sure that the bill um, achieves your policy goal while taking all of those factors into account as well. And I want to note that the mayor has expressed strong support for the policy objective of the bill. Right? He Certainly. Said, I think there are all sorts of folks for whom cash is, is, is still, you know, the go-to option. And there are lots of folks, for whatever reason, who are not going to have a card or are not comfortable using one. And it worries me that they're shut out of the economy and shut out of opportunities. Absolutely. So, so that's strong language. The mayor is clear that the status quo has the effect of shutting out New Yorkers, vulnerable mm -hmm. New Yorkers, from the economy and from opportunities. So. And we agree with that, and I think that's reflected in our testimony. Okay. So I think it seems like we're largely on the same page. I look forward to hearing. but And I recognize that there are efficiency gains that come with a cashless business model, right? Mm -hmm. But my basic contention is that whatever efficiency gains stem from a cashless business model is outweighed by the effect of financial exclusion. Mm -hmm. Right, that in life we have to weigh cost and benefit, and I would argue that the cost of a cashless economy, an exclusively cashless economy, far outweighs the benefit. So, mm -hmm. so that's the extent of my question. 
Thank you. Peter? <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Casey. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah. So uh, we, the old saying is that uh, cash is king, you know. What happened to it? You know? <laughs> so there are, there are a lot of restaurants that only upset cash too. They said no credit cards. So does the DCA have a position on that? Uh, we have not confronted that as a widespread issue. Uh, we're happy to talk to you about that. As is reflected in our testimony, we think that the acceptance of more payment options is good for low and moderate income New Yorkers because there may be people who uh, prefer uh, credit or debit cards over cash for different reasons than someone might prefer cash. And so uh, our general position is that we value consumer choice um, and we think that more payment options are always better. Yeah, I, I think there's a, a, a need for cash in our society, you know, especially like Richard just said, uh, uh, in some areas with high concentration of uh, new immigrants, uh, they, 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 they're used to using cash. And they, because of their recent arrival, uh, they don't have a credit history to apply for credit cards, you know. So, and, and they don't have bank accounts. Having a bank account is expensive too. Uh, some banks, they require a $3,000 balance. Otherwise, they will uh, assess you a fee of $30 or more. Uh, and things like that. So to, to this, that's why a lot of people don't have bank accounts mm -hmm. or, or credit cards. Credit cards charge a high fee. You know, you forget to pay, it's like, 28% interest. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of interest using credit cards. Yeah. So that's why uh, uh, there's still a lot of people who prefer to use cash uh, for the convenience. Once you use it, you don't have to forget, remember where you, know, you have to pay bills. You know? So the bill is still, and, and even myself, when I pay credit cards, uh, either I don't receive the bill or the, the postman delivered the, to the wrong uh, apartments, and I get the like, charge of fee uh, many times. So. Uh, However, I, I think we are moving to a cashless society in the future. Uh, I, I want to challenge every one of you. How many of you have a hun over hundred dollars in your wallet? Not too many, right? Are you? <laughs> right? Only one person. <laughs> so, so uh, if you go to a fancy restaurant to eat, well, hundred dollars is that difference, right? It's not enough, right? So most people, they use their credit cards because of the purpose. You don't know how much money you will spend on the day and also uh, of safety purpose. Also, I think the, the balance is you know, information, informing the customers. You, know, you have to have a good sign outside, this place only take cash, or this place only take, we take both, or only, we take only credit cards. Mm -hmm. yeah, I understand from the business point of view, uh, well, uh, having cash, because having cash is a problem, like you said. No robbery and uh, internal theft, that's a big problem too. Mm -hmm. Internal theft, you know, because you know, when you have credit card, the employees have no incentive to you know, uh, keep in the, the credit card, you know, mm -hmm. unless they want the information from you. And then uh, and a lot of banks, they charge, uh, charge fees to deposit cash now. If you deposit, uh, a few thousand dollars cash uh, every day, they, they charge you uh, uh, a few percent. So it's not worth it to accept cash too. Mm -hmm. So I'm talking about both points, you know, from consumer point of view and from business point of view. So I understand why they say, oh, we only accept credit card. Actually, actually accept credit card is to the disadvantage. They have to pay a fee for it. Uh, two, three percent, and American Express is like five percent of the, inc the fees the money go to the fees. Mm -hmm. so, that, so this is a dilemma for us. We have to pay, you know, I think we have to do, use a combination to address this problem. For those who want to use credit card, let them use credit card. For those who don't want to, let them use cash. So, so I prefer that we, 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 I go to the first bill that you pull a sign that this establishment, establishment, establishment only accept cash for this establishment, establishment only a set credit card. So mm -hmm. the consumers will know a way, a way away that uh, whether they want to uh, go into the store. Mm -hmm. But I, should, I think we should mandate all supermarkets dealing with foods, they have to accept cash as an as a option. Mm -hmm. Because people need to buy food to eat, right? Mm -hmm. Milk, uh, uh, for convenience stores, 
those days when they was lending then to uh, say cash. Uh, you can't. That's it. That's my, that's my question and comment. Yeah. Yeah, I think Councilmember, you're you're highlighting really two things that um, that both of which we agree with. The first is that um, the uh, array of financial products out there can be confusing, um, mm -hmm. and there can it can be hard to understand, especially for someone who hasn't had um, an, a relationship with a financial institution before, and they may end up in a situation where they're paying more in fees than they should, where they're not getting the product or service that they um, need and deserve, and that's. Uh, why we have financial empowerment centers, because our counselors can guide people toward the low fee products that have the features that they need and want, and that will allow them to plan their financial future going forward. So that's that's one piece. And then the second piece is, uh, as you said, the uh, this needs to be uh, an all of the above approach, we think, because um, setting aside the issue of cash cashless or cash only policies, the reality is, as Councilmember Torres said, technology is going to continue to evolve, and um, the economy is going to become more digitized. And so we think the most powerful thing that we can do for an unbanked or underbanked New Yorker is to connect them to those financial services. Because today we're here talking primarily about retail and food service establishments, but we don't know what will, what will be going cashless next. And by helping people to get those accounts, we're equipping them for a future that we may not even be able to anticipate. New businesses that are becoming cashless, new payment options that may be better for them than cash. So that's certainly something that we, uh, that we agree on, that there needs to be a combination of increasing access today, um, but also connecting people with financial accounts to equip them for what may be an increasingly cashless future. So we, uh, you know, as, as I said in my testimony, um, we support a policy that requires retail and food service establishments to accept cash, but we are also very focused on um, making sure that people who are now unbanked or underbanked get connected to those services so that they can make the choice for themselves. And I think that was mentioned a few times by different members of this committee. We think consumers should be able to make a choice, and in order for them to be able to make it an informed choice, they have to have both options open to them. And if you are only a, if you only have access to cash, there's only one option, and there's no real choice there. Brad, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair, uh, Councilmember Torres. I'm proud to be a co-sponsor of this bill, and I appreciate your uh, introduction of it, and I uh, appreciate the testimony. I guess I just want to ask a little more. Um, you know, I think you're right. I mean, I, I support this bill. We want to do everything we can to make sure unbanked New Yorkers are connected to financial services. But for those who still are, um, whether because they're locked out for the ranges of the, re the range of reasons that the Councilmember Torres spoke of. Uh, or who choose to be for other reasons, um, we should not lock them out of the economy. Um, I appreciate all the work that Department of Consumer Affairs is doing to provide people with access to banking services. Mm -hmm. I just wonder, there's some things folks are talking about at sort of a bigger picture level, you know, uh, various forms of public banking, postal banking, mm -hmm. library banking, mm -hmm. um, you know, various steps we could take to go further in our mandates to the financial services industry to push for even better versions of low-cost accounts to get to mm -hmm. some of the things that Councilmember Koo talked about. So you guys are doing a lot of things to try to connect people to financial services under the sort of current constraints of the marketplace. Mm -hmm. and I just wonder if you guys have given thought to taking a look at some of these bigger picture, bigger push next steps toward really substantially opening up uh, affordable retail financial services sure. to New Yorkers in some in some bigger way. So you're absolutely correct that we are we're focused on um, on connecting people with services today. So with services that are available to them and that will be helpful to them in the short term and in the long term. Um, at the same time, we are we're certainly open to participating in conversations about what the next step is, what the new you know what products would be most responsive to the needs of unbanked and underbanked New Yorkers, what, th you know, what is not on the market now or not offered otherwise that could be offered to them. We're certainly, we certainly want to be part of that conversation and I think that we have, um, you know, we've done original research and we've worked with um, different organizations to try and design new products, not, not library and postal banking yet, but, the, uh, but we have worked on helping to align products with what we see, both on the ground and from our financial partners, 
as the most necessary features for unbanked and underbanked New Yorkers. And uh, I think we've had a lot of success with that, particularly working with credit unions. Um, and you know, you, as you are all aware, the, the IDNYC has been um, a big uh, door opener for people who want to open accounts with, um, with certain banks and, and credit unions. And I think that w we certainly want to be part of that conversation with you about what products are most responsive, what services are most responsive, and, and what the next steps for financial access are. Great, thank you. I mean, I think your testimony speaks both to the, you know, the value of this bill, the sincere and good work that DCA is doing, and the gap we still face. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's just worth pushing ourselves on, you know, what are the things that people are doing. I, you know, I. I feel like at the beginning, as the 2020 presidential race was setting up, it, you know, there were some folks starting to talk about these much more ambitious ideas like, uh, you know, postal banking, which I confess sounds kind of crazy to me because the post office in my neighborhood, you could barely get your mail from, so whether they would really be able to provide the financial services, but the basic idea that we ought to be able, whether through local government or the federal government, to enable people to have access to some of these services without being extorted um, as a result of their poverty seems like something we should really push ourselves hard to do. So mm -hmm. thank you for your testimony here today. We look forward to following up. Thank you. Thank you. you know, I, I just want to, I agree that in the long, long term there could be value in integrating more people into uh, a cashless economy. Right. But the question is, what do we do in the short term? Mm -hmm. uh, we're not going to integrate underbank New Yorkers overnight. It's true. But, but, but I think there's an, an even further nuance. I, it's true that we're living in an economy that's increasingly digitized. It's also true that we're living in a time where there's a greater backlash against corporate surveillance. You know, think of social media platforms and their mishandling of our private data. There's never been a greater suspicion of corporate power Mm -hmm. And so there are some people who will never want to use credit cards or debit cards, who will only want to use cash because it is protective of their privacy, because it insulates them from what they take to be corporate surveillance. Like that, those two trends are, it is true that we're becoming more cashless, but it's also true that there is a greater backlash against the sale of our personal data and corporate surveillance over our personal lives. And just a an ever-deepening suspicion of corporate power over our lives. Mm -hmm. So that, that, that's why I think cash should always remain an option, even as we integrate more people into an increasingly cashless economy. Mm -hmm. we, we agree with you, Council Member. And I think we, I would actually add that there are, other, there are plenty of other reasons why someone would continue to prefer to use cash even if they have access to a credit or debit card. So uh, a big population we see this with are uh, seniors who are accustomed to using cash. They, they have a credit card or debit card for emergencies, but that's not what they want to use on, uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. So there's plenty of reasons that someone would want to make sure that c cash is available, and we, we agree with you that it should be an option. Yeah, and it's, it's worth noting that, you know, everyone knows there's been a, a public backlash against the sighting of Amazon in Long Island City. Uh, and it's been revealed to me that you know, am, there's a real concern that Amazon is displacing small businesses, re brick and mortar businesses, and has plans to open its own cashless businesses. So a trend that's beginning at the margins can spread like wildfire throughout the city when you have a trillion dollar company like Amazon that's intent on opening these cashless businesses in major cities like New York. So I think that the trend, I, I feel that we should intervene before the trend spirals out of control and has a real-world exclusionary effect on underbanked New Yorkers. And I, and I, I suspect we agree on the overarching points. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Peter? So uh, I, I have an idea right, of the, uh, how to help the <coughs> people who doesn't have bank accounts if they want to use a, 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 a credit card. So in, in Hong Kong, uh, every metro card holder, uh, they can add money to their, their metro card. You can have five hundred dollars there, then you can use that metro card to buy stuff. Mm -hmm. This I'm saying as a cash. And, uh, any stores, and the uh, convenience supermarkets, they will take the metro card. They just swipe it, and without knowing your identity, but you, because you are a metro card holder, so the money is in there. Whatever money you in there, you can access. You can, of course, you can use it to access the, the train too. Right? You can go to the train station, 
uh, for two seventy five or three dollars. But the money in there, you can use it for uh, uh, to do a lot of things, uh, transactions, other things. You know, it's the same thing like cash. So that will help the the people without uh, credit references. Uh, you don't need identity. There's no identity there for using a metro card, right? Okay, anyone can buy a metro card. They don't ask your ID. But you can use ID. But, but right now, the technology in here is not ready yet. So you have to have a, like a, a credit card, like chip touch technology to go to the station, to go in the stations. Like in, it's very popular in Hong Kong, in Asia. Uh, that you can add money to your metro card uh, for uh, anyone can can do that. You know, for your co very convenient. You don't have to carry change. You buy a newspaper, buy coffee. You just touch it and there you go. So maybe the city to encourage. We have the NYC identity card, right? So we can add a picture in there. You can put money in there, mm -hmm. uh, and then they deduct money from there. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, council member. I think we're always open to innovative new approaches to expand financial access, and I think the administration is exploring. Um, some things similar to what you just suggested, um, and we're happy to you know, have a, uh, more of a conversation with you about where that's going. Karen? I would just like to say I'd like to add my name to this bill. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, don't have any, I, ha I don't have any questions, but thank you. Thank Appreciate you, members. Next panel, we have Edgar Laborde from the RWDSU, uh, Julian Robinson from New Economy Project, and Andy Cajado from the Financial Clinic. That's it. Yeah. And feel free to begin once you settle down. Good morning. My name is Edgar Laborde, and I am representing the Retail Wholesale Department Store Union, and we respectively submit this uh, testimony of support for uh, Intro 1281, uh, which bans retail establishment from refusing to accept cash payments. The RWDSU represents 100,000 members, including more than 25,000 in New York City. These members live and work in, in the city and are employed uh, by uh, hundreds of food and retail establishments. More and more businesses are moving towards cashless business model that disadvantages low-income people and people of color. Cashless businesses do not accept cash. They only accept credit cards and debit cards. And to have a credit card, a person must have a bank account. This means that people without bank accounts and without credit cards are excluded from these businesses and uh, are excluded from participating in the local economy. In fact, large portions of the populations are in, of this population are unbanked or underbanked. Uh, communities of color, low-income people, the disabled, and other marginalized households go on banks at rates far higher than the national average. Close to 17% of black households and 14% of Latinx households are unbanked compared to an average of 6.5 nationally, and a, an average of white households of only 3%. In addition, about one in five households have no credit, and without credit, you cannot access this needed credit cards to purchase at uh, businesses that do not accept cash. Cashless businesses range from bookstores to coffee shops and restaurants, and it's only a matter of time before this discrimin discriminatory practice expands to other business types. Credit card companies and cashless enterprises promote the cash-free economy without addressing its financial burden on low-income New Yorkers and communities of color. Cashless institutions encourage a fintech Jim Crow by restricting the places where people of color can shop, eat, and receive basic services. By refusing to serve low-income New Yorkers and communities of colors, Cashless establishments carve out niche in niches in, gu in gentrified uh, neighborhoods through cash exclusion in already an unaffordable city. 
The growth of this field can drive up prices for communities as cash-free businesses pass credit card processing fees onto customers and cash-accepting enterprises raise prices just to keep up. There is a simple fix to ensure that low-income people and people of color are not disadvantaged by cashless business. New York City can simply ban cashless businesses. There is a pre precedence for this approach, as has been discussed earlier. Massachusetts has required businesses to accept cash since 1978. The New Jersey State Legislature advanced a, a ban on cashless food and retail businesses that's going before the Senate. Chicago um, has also um, taken up this conversation, uh, the Washington, D.C. Council, uh, and Philadelphia. Banning cashless businesses will not address the underlying issue that low-income New Yorkers lack adequate access to banking services. However, these issues are not mutually exclusive, uh, and both should be addressed immediately. We hope that the City Council will move to pass this bill that will ban cashless business model that disadvantages low-income people and people of color. Thank you. Thank you, Committee Chair Espinal and the other members of the committee for the opportunity to testify today. I'm Julian Robinson, and I represent New Economy Project, an economic justice organization that serves low-income New Yorkers throughout New York City. New Economy Project uh, has, for 24 years, worked with grassroots groups to challenge Wall Street and other corporations that perpetuate inequality, poverty, and segregation, and to work with community groups to build new institutions that are grounded in cooperation, democracy, economic, racial, and gender justice. Given the points I'm going to discuss in my testimony today, mere notice is not sufficient to address the economic and racial justice issues that are at play. As such, New Economy Project supports Intro 1281, sponsored by Councilmember Richie Torres, prohibiting retail establishments from refusing to accept cash payments. The emerging trend by some businesses to no longer accept cash payments is disturbing on many fronts. It has a discriminatory impact on low-income New Yorkers who face many barriers uh, to fair banking services, and it has a discriminatory impact on people of color who live in communities that banks still redline to this day. It promotes a shift to inferior and poorly regulated digital payments, prepaid cards, and other non-bank services, and it requires people to seek even more personal information to large companies, exposing them to privacy and surveillance risks. This morning, I will focus on the following. Persistent bank redlining in New York City neighborhoods of color, concerns about financial technology or fintech companies in the emerging cashless economy, and the need for bold solutions to address our two-tiered financial system, which serves to perpetuate poverty, inequality, and segregation in New York City. First, persistent redlining in New York City neighborhoods of color. Cashless retail outlets effectively reinforce the systemic inequities in our financial system and our economy at large. They present New Yorkers who live in redlined communities with two bad options. Either purchase a high-cost, under-regulated financial product like a prepaid card, or be left unable to make any purchases at all. If we'll take a look at some of the maps I provided with my testimony, the first one you'll see is a, a map of the city. In Southeast Queens, Central Brooklyn, and the South Bronx, in the neighborhoods of color, you'll see that there's fewer than one bank branch per 10,000 residents. In the, if you look at the following two maps, map two and three, you'll see the Upper East Side of Manhattan and East Harlem. On the Upper East Side of Manhattan, you'll see so many bank branches that there are reports of folks in those communities complaining that there are too many bank branches in their neighborhood. In East Harlem, you'll see a complete lack of bank branches, especially above 96th Street. And in that void are high cost and predatory financial services, like check cashers and pawn shops. I'd be more than happy to answer any, any other questions you have about these maps after my testimony. Two, concerns about fintech companies in the emerging cashless economy. Cashless businesses, by their very nature, create an exclusive marketplace in which New Yorkers must accept the terms and conditions of private entities in order to participate. Requiring people to rely on this private infrastructure, simply to buy school supplies, food, or medicine, for example, grants an inordinate amount of power to corporations that are more accountable to their investment investors than to New York City neighborhoods and New Yorkers, especially now as Amazon threatens to bring a wave of gentrification to Western Queens with their HQ2 development, and as they consider a plan to open numerous cashless and cashierless businesses all over New York, it is imperative that the council look for ways to eliminate not enhance the serious financial burden on low-income New Yorkers and on New Yorkers of color. Three, 
There's a need for bold solutions, as Councilmember Lander suggested, to address our two-tiered financial system, which perpetuates poverty, inequality, and segregation throughout the city. As I've outlined throughout the testimony, there are deep structural inequalities in our current financial system. Intro 1281 is an important step in the right direction, ensuring no New Yorker will be excluded from the economy solely because they lack a credit card, a bank account, or requiring them to purchase a high cost and underregulated uh, financial product like a prepaid card. The council should support this bill as part of a broad and bold platform to address inequality and segregation in our two-tiered financial system. The council should support efforts to democratize our economy with and for communities that have been exploited and excluded from the mainstream financial system for decades. For example, groups around the city are actively organizing for increased funding for mission-driven community development financial institutions, for community land trusts and other non-speculative housing models, to strengthen and to strengthen expand to strengthen and expand worker food and financial and other cooperatives, and to establish the first municipal public bank in the nation, and much more. There are many meaningful ways in which the council can support these efforts, and we hope you'll consider them going forward. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is Andy Collado. I'm the assistant director of services at the Financial Clinic. Uh, founded in 2005, the Financial Clinic builds the financial security of poor New Yorkers by providing free one-on-one -on -one coaching in collaboration with nonprofits and social service organizations and agencies across the city. Our job is to meet financially insecure people where they are, to support and empower them to achieve their financial goals that matter the most to them, and to help them navigate the many systemic economic barriers that keep them from living secure and prosperous lives. I'd like to start by thanking uh, Committee Chair Spinal and the other members of the Consumer Affairs Committee uh, for holding today's hearing and for the opportunity to give testimony in support of regulating the ability of retail establishments to, uh, to refuse cash payment. I would also like to thank Councilmember Torres for taking seriously the unequal impact that cashless businesses uh, have on many New Yorkers for introducing this bill. I feel very lucky that I get to work every day as a financial coach. I have the opportunity to see the challenges and barriers affecting financially insecure New Yorkers, challenges and barriers that others might miss. I am especially attuned to these issues being a first generation American myself and a proud son of immigrants. At first glance, an issue like shops and restaurants going cashless uh, might not seem like a big deal to most people. But for a significant number of New Yorkers, new immigrants are undocumented, the low and mid-income many. It means that they are unable to shop at the same restaurants as everyone else or stores. That this may start with a restaurant, but trickles very quickly become floods. It means that they're effectively cut off from participating in the economic systems that can mean the difference between food and water at dinner, clothes on their backs, or roofs over their heads. It's worth pointing out that reports of death of cash notwithstanding, recent data from the Federal Reserve shows that customers still use cash more frequently than any other form of payment. Cash is overwhelmingly the preferred way to pay for purchases under $25. It's the method used most often in general by low-income folks and people over 65, something that's already been mentioned today often. And it's something that I confirm every day in my daily work. The poor, the undocumented, the people of color are disproportionately, disproportionately more likely to be unbanked, face greater barriers to opening up credit cards and debit cards because they could lack a social security number, they could have poor credit, or they could even be on check systems, preventing them from opening an account in the first place. These groups are effectively locked out of patronizing a shop or restaurant that chooses to go cashless. The impact on these communities alone should give us pause. The gains in time, efficiency, or customer experience that opponents of these regulations report surely are not worth the exclusion imposed on our friends and our neighbors. Um, I want to take a moment to highlight the unique impact of the cashless trend on the undocumented. According to the Fiscal Policy Institute, undocumented immigrants in New York contribute over a billion dollars every year in state and local taxes. Thanks to Mayor de Blasio and the members of the City Council, the IDNYC allows many undocumented New Yorkers to get a bank account. Their options, though, are not unlimited. Uh, less than 30% of banks right now accept IDNYC for the purpose of opening a bank account. And the current national climate, you could very well understand the healthy skepticism in the immigrant community of sharing their personal information with anyone, let alone a bank. I have yet to actually sit with an undocumented New Yorker who actually knew they could open an account with an IDNYC card. 
and I've seen over a thousand people in the last three years. So should we accept as opponents of these rules do that there will just be some places undocumented New Yorkers can't go and shop or buy food? <laughs> Lastly, it's important to be clear that this issue is not about just pitting the unbanked versus the banked, though that should be a very critical concern. There are also many New Yorkers that own bank accounts, but for many number of reasons, um, mostly need or just prefer to use cash. The tipped workers, for example, see much more of their income in cash. Here, too, though, there's a dynamic of inequality. Many New Yorkers are forced to rely mostly on cash because it's inconvenient or impractical to them to regularly visit a bank or ATM because there's not one near them. In Sunset Park, where our offices are located, there's only one bank branch to serve 8,500 residents. When payday comes or maybe the tax refund check arrives, many underbank customers in these neighborhoods will go to one of the city's many check cashers because paying a fee is easier for them to get to a bank. 43% of the customers the financial clinic assists with filing their taxes do not use direct deposit for their tax refund. And when they have cashed that check, they turn around and buy food. Can we agree that access to that food should be a human right and that they should never be turned away because of a piece of plastic? I strongly urge this committee to end this discriminatory practice, protect all New Yorkers' right to pay for food or services in the way that is right for them, and pass intro 1281. Thank you for your time today and your attention to this matter. Richard? I have a few questions. Um, can you, and the question could be directed to RWDSU or anyone can if you explain, just explain in greater detail the Amazon effect on the cashless economy? Well, um, there, are, there are several um, Amazon Go stores or Amazon stores yeah. that only allow um, for payment through um, credit card, uh, Amazon Prime account, or if they were to purchase an Amazon card at another location and bringing that card and purchasing the item um, at, at, at that store. And my understanding is that Amazon takes digitization to the extreme, so not only is there no cash, there are no cashiers, right? There, there, there are people that accept um, that accept the the, the, the credit card, um, and 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 they also accept the payment by having or helping the customer sign into their Amazon Prime account so that they can purchase it. Yeah. And it affects it affects the number of cashiers. Uh, it could affect the number of cashiers yeah. in the store. N now, some have said that. You know, some of my arguments are too apocalyptic because the trend of cashlessness is at the margins in New York City, but a company the size of Amazon has the ability to spread the cashless business model much more widely. Um, you, you have indications that Amazon is intent on opening brick and mortar cashless businesses, not only here in New York City, but elsewhere in the country. W what is that based on and what's the, the scale of cashless businesses that Amazon's looking to pursue? Well, I think um, um, what you're referring to are the reports that Amazon itself has put out yeah. um, in terms of um, their goals, uh, in terms of um, opening up uh, additional uh, thousands of Amazon stores across the country. Uh, so uh, according to Amazon, they, they have uh, communicated that this is um, um, a direction that they're looking to, to go in terms of more brick and mortar stores. Yeah. And, and I, guess, I guess a question for any of you, you know, I, I think we often think of a cashless business model as a convenience, but what you're essentially telling us is that we have to situate it in the historical context of redlining, right? So do you want to explain how what might seem like a benign, neutral business model actually fits into our country's dark history of, we, one term was FinTech, Jim Crow, financial racism, there's a whole host of words you could use to describe it. Mm -hmm. um, so since the 1930s, when redlining maps started to be produced, actually by the federal government, there has been a deep structural and racial inequality in provision of financial services, um, in particular in communities of color, in particular in immigrant communities, in particular in low-income communities. Uh, that has persisted since the 30s, and you can see it um, in the maps I provided today. In there are still large sections of the city, and still inhabited by people of color that have no access to fair and affordable and accessible financial services. Um, and what that does is, in that space come high cost 
and predatory financial services like check cashers and pawn shops. And we see prepaid cards as a similar high cost um, and predatory product uh, as it costs people money to access their own income. Uh, I believe as my colleague from the financial or clinic mentioned, um, people are paying money at these check cashers because they need cash in order to buy food. Right, so when you're, when you're adopting a business model, you're not doing so in a vacuum. No. You're uh, doing so in a historical context. So if we were to move it toward a cashless economy, we're raising the risk of entangling low-income New Yorkers with predatory financial products. Can you explain more the products that are out there? Sure. We, so fortunately, because of strong New York state laws, there, is no, there are no payday loans in New York. But we do have check cashers, we do have pawn shops, we do have places where, because there is no bank branch where people can safely deposit their money, there is no credit union that offers people uh, accounts that meet their needs, uh, people must, is, it's expensive to be poor, is sort of the old adage. And people are paying money to these high cost and predatory services because of the structural inequity in our financial system and in our economy at large. Now I'm gonna play devil's advocate, right? Suppose for a moment I concede there's limited access to credit, right? Some people have no credit report, some people have an abysmal credit rating. And suppose I concede, because it's factually the case, that there are communities that have no traditional banking options, right? <coughs> One argument I've heard is that everyone can get a prepaid debit card. If I go to a convenience store, you could easily buy a prepaid debit card. And voila, you're integrated into the cashless economy. Why does that argument underestimate the barriers that low-income New Yorkers face? Those prepaid cards cost money by requiring low-income New Yorkers to pay more than right. New Yorkers that have means to open a bank account, that have, you know, that live in a neighborhood where bank branches are present, you are burdening the already burdened. You are burdening low-income New Yorkers. You are burdening immigrant New Yorkers, undocumented New Yorkers, um, and people of color in this city further um, by f while they exist in a financial system that already burdens them so much. Um, so a prepaid card is a way to enter into the cashless economy, but it comes at a serious cost for people who don't have the means to pay that cost. Right, so if you're steering everyone toward a debit card and you have to pay a fee, you're effectively imposing a tax on poverty. And you're also increasing insecurity because if they lose that prepaid debit card, right. that's it. They're cut off from that money until they send them a new prepaid debit card in yeah. the mail. Right, this is why having cash on hand is important. Right. And, and I will confess, I, I occasionally use my credit card. I lose my credit cards or my debit cards, but I could afford to buy a new one. If you're a low-income New Yorker who's living paycheck to paycheck and every dollar counts, you can only afford to lose so many cards. Mm -hmm. um, you spoke about, we know that traditional banking is heavily regulated. And you mentioned that the, finance, the alternative financial services tend to be poorly regulated. Can you provide more detail on that? I can get back to you with more yeah. details and a bit more information and research on that. But what we have seen is that the check cashers and the pawn shops have um, they offer predatory services, uh, they offer high cost services, and they don't have the stringent regulations that the traditional banking services and the mainstream financial system, including credit unions, have in place. Uh, I, I appreciate your testimony and, and thank you for just providing historical context for uh, the cashless business model. Thank you, Mr. Chu. Margaret? Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, Thank you for your testimony, and uh, I think that's still um, an issue that we have not taken care of in terms of helping people who don't have the opportunity to open bank accounts and and being taken advantage of by all these, you know, the the cash place where they you know charge a fee to cash the check, and it's still all over different low income neighborhood. In one part of my district in Chinatown, they got a bank on every corner, but a lot of people still don't use credit card. They still use cash. Now, have you done any kind of like research or even with Department of Consumer Affairs, like which are the businesses that are starting this? From my own experience, I mean, usually when I go for lunch, I, I try to pay by cash. It's just so much easier. I don't have to worry about my credit card bill. Uh, all of a sudden, one day, I went into one of the places that I patronize once in a while, and they didn't take credit, I mean, they didn't take cash. I was surprised, and there was no sign, of course, until I got to the register. 
um, but it's not a cheap place. So one of the things that I've been seeing around is that a lot of the store that are starting this um, cashless thing are the more expensive stores or stores that in some way is sending a message that we only want certain type of customers. People who can pay uh, for this product, you know, $12, $13 for this salad or whatever. And I think that is like something that is really, if that expand, it's really gonna create that discrimination and that exclusion um, that if you don't have a credit card, then we don't want you. Uh, you don't have the opportunity to try out this product or to purchase this product because you don't have a credit card. So I think that's really is, to me, is like it's really sending a really bad message going down the road um, because this is just a recent phenomenon. So I think it'd be good to really try to track like what are the businesses that are doing that. And it seems like a lot of them are these um, franchise um, that are opening up, but a more high end um, that are starting this. Have you noticed that? Um, well, I actually want to step back a point that you mentioned earlier about uh, the price being high at some of these places. Um, honestly, I think that's completely irrelevant because I deal with financial goals every day. You know, there are many times that I have a client sit in front of me, and that goal for them is to be able to take um, sorry, to be able to, you know, take their family out for a nice dinner at a nice restaurant that maybe they don't get to go to every time, but they save up for every month to get to do that, right? And so you're cutting off this, these, these areas of fulfillment and joy that can, that can be the one, two, three times a year this low-income immigrant family has a chance to go out to that nice restaurant, right? So it's very important for us not to cut off these avenues of joy for lower income and immigrant populations because what are you really telling them there, right? This is not for you. Like, that's not what we do. That's not what New Yorkers stand for. And stopping, stopping um, from getting to that point is very important, which is why this intro is, is, so, um, is so important today, right? Like I said earlier, this, it, it, it could it could just be restaurants now, right? Who's to say this doesn't kick down the line to retail institutions, you know, and down the line, which maybe they don't accept rent by cash anymore, right? What do what are we, what are we showing to the future, you know, citizens of this of this uh, city? Thank you. Good. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Leo Kremer, Michelle uh, from Dos Toros Taqueria, uh, Michelle got to, got Gauthier from Mulberry and Vine, Anna Maria, I'm sorry, I can't read your last name, uh, by, by Chloe, and Jillian Grossberg by Chloe.
You may begin. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Anna Maria Ferenc. I'm one of the regional directors for By Chloe. Uh, we are a fast, casual, uh, plant based uh, vegan uh, restaurant chain now with 13 locations, uh, including six of them in, the New, York, in New York City. Uh, we are a female founded company that first opened in July of 2015, and we currently employ over 240 employees in the New York City metro area. Um, Caring for our employees has always been a priority to us. Uh, we have a track record of uh, highly promoting from within, and we have always uh, offered uh, health insurance benefits and benefits that exceeded the minimum requirements since our inception. Uh, we currently do operate as a cashless, uh, res as cashless restaurant in New York City. When we first opened in two 2015 with our first location, we, we did uh, accept cash. We transitioned into a cashless chain in the fall of 2017 and uh, completely went cashless in New York in January um, 2018. Uh, just before the, the transition uh, into a cashless establishment, cash represented less than 10% of our total transactions, uh, predominantly from tourists. Uh, we closely monitored for all customer feedback regarding the new policy. Uh, the transition proved to be very smooth with minimal customer complaints. The primary reason why we decided to go to um, a cashless format and continues to stay cashless is uh, for the safety of, of our employees. By not keeping any cash in our stores, our employees feel safer, especially in our pre-opening and closing hours when our stores are relatively empty. We do have lower volume stores where at the beginning of the day for a number of hours, at the end of the no uh, day for a number of hours, there would be only one employee in the uh, front of the house. Although that we know that um, lately it's unlikely, news reports of local restaurants being robbed at gunpoint create a uh, cause of concerns. Uh, there have been instances of robbery within blocks of several of our locations, um, including uh, the fall 2016 robbery at Sweet Greens in Union Square <coughs> and the summer uh, 2018 rob robbery of um, Adelaia on Irving Place. Not keeping cash in our stores is an easy way for us um, to help our employees feel uh, more comfortable at work um, uh, and uh, feel safer, including our managers who do not have to carry large amounts of cash in a bag, in a handbag, in a paper bag, back and uh, forth from the bank uh, every day. Importantly, going cashless is also aligned with our mission of using plant-based food as a platform for sustainability. The, envir uh, in the environmental benefits may seem small, but going cashless has helped us to further reduce our carbon uh, uh, footprint. The increasing availability of prepaid cards and mobile penetration increases the accessibili accessibility to digital payments for everyone. As digital payments become increasingly pre prevalent, we believe that our choice to be cashless is the best for our cust uh, customers, for our employees, and our business as well. Uh, we aspire to be inclusive and welcome everyone to eat at our restaurants, and we do empower our managers to make reasonable accommodations whenever possible for customers with only cash. Thank you. Hello. Thank you for uh, having me here. Um, so we, we went into uh, this business uh, opening Dos Toros Taqueria because we wanted to share with our guests the California style Mexican cuisine that we grew up loving, not because we wanted to be cashless. Uh, we are only interested in being cashless because it allows us to serve our guests more smoothly, operate more efficiently, and significantly enhances our ability to improve our team training and morale, and by extension, to create a more compelling guest experience, which is the entire goal of hospitality. Going cashless has been enormously helpful in these respects. We think of ourselves as ethical corporate members of our community and take pride in doing the right thing. We partner closely with South Bronx United to help kids go to college, We've donated over 100,000 meals over the years to the New York Food Bank, in addition to volunteering our time. And we've not, uh, not just made financial contributions, but have directly worked with getting out and staying out to employ and offer career opportunities to formerly incarcerated individuals. We try to do right by the environment by sourcing only naturally raised proteins and composting all kitchen food waste. Most significantly, 
We employ over 500 amazing team members and are proud to pay them $15 an hour, and in most cases more than that, along with other benefits and real opportunities for growth and career advancement. I should add that we strongly encourage our new team members to start a bank account if they don't already have one and set up direct deposit for their paycheck. We think people ought to be encouraged to join the banking system rather than be taken advantage of by check cashing services. We are only able to do all these things if we have a sustainable business model. I want to emphasize that we are enthusiastic supporters of the $15 minimum wage and welcome the opportunity to pay our team members a living wage in a level, competitive environment. But make no mistake, the higher minimum wage puts significant pressure on our bottom line. For a business, running an efficient operation is the difference between staying open or shutting down. If you've walked around New York City recently, you'll see many vacant storefronts. Business survival is not a given, and we feel that new laws should not be introduced to make running a healthy business even more challenging than it already is. I think it's worth pointing out that Massachusetts has an existing rule against being cashless, and it's one additional reason that when we decided to expand into a second market, we chose Chicago rather than Boston. There are other arguments against this legislation I would like to mention briefly. Uh, we believe it is safer for our team to not deal with cash. We've been robbed twice previously and not once since going cashless. It's expensive for us to pay for armored car service, to buy straps of change, spend hours of our restaurant leader's time setting up cash drawers, counting drawers, recounting drawers, dealing with deposit slips and bags, paying bank fees to accept cash, and having to discipline or even fire team members over cash discrepancies. We pay all taxes owed on all revenue received, which is definitely not happening at certain establishments, particularly businesses that are cash only, and this would seem like a very positive thing for the city. The entire internet and all of e-commerce is cashless, as are all apps and airlines and, and many government services. Why are we being held to a different standard? Uh, we think it's clear the future of currency is electronic. Things are moving in that direction already in many parts of the world. In the meantime, businesses that consistently serve the unbanked and underbanked population aren't going to go cashless. It wouldn't make sense for them. And if someone without a bank account wants to patronize a cashless business, they can convert cash to a prepaid card at many convenience stores such as Walgreens or Dwayne Reed. Uh, we sympathize with wanting to protect members of our community that are more socioeconomically challenged, but this is not the way to accomplish that goal. Let's pull those members of our community forward into the modern financial system rather than pulling the business community backward with a well-intentioned but ill-advised and burdensome regulation. Thank you. Good morning or afternoon, most of it. Um, my name is Michelle Gauche. I've lived in New York for 20 years, and I own five fast casual restaurants called Mulberry and Vine. I'm opposed to bill number 1281-2018 entitled prohibiting retail establishments from refusing to accept payment in cash. I went cashless, cashless in April of 2016 solely for the benefit of my employees. The management of cash can be an incredible burden. We close at 9 p.m. and my employees were consistently getting out around 11 dealing with the cash drawer reconciliation. Once I went cashless, my employees were out by 9.30. Another factor in my decision to go cashless was a multiple bank runs a week to get the correct change. Tellers have been taken over by kiosks, so the wait for a teller can be anywhere from five to 20 minutes. We were a busy, lunch-driven restaurant. It was very stressful for my employees not knowing how long the bank run would take. Going cashless has certainly produced other unintended benefits, faster moving lines, simplified bookkeeping, but my original intention to take away unnecessary stress from an incredibly stressful job has been a huge win for my employees. It saddens me that a decision that was made for the best interest of my employees could be misconstrued as classist or discriminatory. Many of my employees are the same people I'm supposedly discriminating against, yet they wholeheartedly agree with my decision to go cashless. Our cashless policy was never intended to upset, embarrass, or lose a customer, nor to be political. It just simply works a whole lot better for us. While we do not accept cash as a form of payment, we have never turned away a customer. We make accommodations for anyone who wants our food, and we do it with a smile on our face. I'm a full-time single parent of two and a small business owner in New York City. I'm in a very tough industry, and removing the management and burden of cash was one of the best decisions I've made. I urge you to oppose, oppose this bill. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jillian Grossberg. I'm sorry if I sound nervous. It's because I am. <laughs> Um, I have worked with Anna Maria at By Chloe since uh, the November of 2016. I have worked as a front of house member and a cashier since then. Um, when I first got there, we were accepting cash fully, but we ran into a lot of problems along the way. 
Um, when we stopped taking cash in the early 2017 area, we had a couple of eyebrow raises, but we explained to them the reasons why we did it for the safety of our employees. Um, we had a lot of problems with going to the bank every single morning. We had to take thousands of dollars in paper bags to the bank. We had banks reject giving us a certain amount of change because so many different um, companies within the area wanted the same amount of change for their companies. Um, we also had problem with problems with fake bills and then therefore people like myself who have never really handled money like that had to rely on machines and markers to tell whether banknotes were um, actually legitimate and it was difficult when we argued with customers and we had just as much ex experience as they did. Um, we also, like Anna Maria said, are alone a lot in the restaurant and it is difficult with a restaurant completely covered by glass windows. Uh, people can obviously tell when we're alone and when uh, we keep our doors um, open a lot for cleaners to come in and out at night, it is dangerous for them even if we lock them because they know that uh, there aren't many people in there and that there are safes that people keep cash in underneath. Um, I have worked in the retail and food business since I was able to get a job and all of my friends have done the same to keep themselves in college. Um, a lot of my friends have had experiences where people have walked into their stores uh, with guns and they had to make the decision to open a cash drawer and give them all the money that was in there. And I, do nev I never want to make that decision and I know that now I will never have to. Um, we have had incidents at By Chloe where uh, one of our employees even ran after someone when they tried to steal cash. It was dangerous for them, it was dangerous for us, and we also wondered what would happen if a customer tried to run after them. Um, we uh, never want to exclude anyone from eating at By Chloe, and we love all our customers who come in every single day who we know by name. Um, but if we ban pe uh, companies like ours from going cashless, we're taking away the option for our employers to say that this is the safest, safest option for its employees. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? I thank you for your testimony. Um, obviously, you know more about how to run a business than I do, so I will take for granted the benefits of a cashless business model. I do want to make a, a few points. I'm, you know, I have the honor of representing Arthur Abbey, which has some of the most iconic businesses in the country. Some of these businesses have endured for more than 100 years, accept cash, and are able to operate smoothly and efficiently and safely in the Bronx, which is probably much tougher than some of the neighborhoods in which you operate. But I, I take your points. I do want to respond to I guess the, the notion that, because I feel like there's an attempt to portray the use of cash as dangerous and as a prohibitive burden, but if, if cash were so dangerous or a prohibitive burden, how do we explain the fact that the vast majority of businesses continue to use cash? Right, that's, uh, that's one point I would make. Um, and I do want to respond to a comment that Michelle made. Uh, you said, it saddens me that a decision that was made for the best interests of my employees could be misconstrued as classes or discriminatory. Many of my employees are the same people I'm supposedly discriminating against, yet they wholeheartedly agree with my decision to go cashless. I just want to be clear, I'm, I don't know who you are. I, I am in no way claiming that you are discriminatory or classist or racist, but I have concerns that a cashless business model, you could be Mother Teresa. You could be the most philanthropic, wonderful human being on the face of the earth and you can adopt the cashless business model with the best of intentions, our concern is that it could have the effect of disadvantaging underbanked New Yorkers. Right? I think you pointed out we should encourage people to join the banking system, but the banking system has no presence in the poorest neighborhoods in our city. Right? We have low-income New Yorkers who have no traditional banking options in their neighborhoods and who are susceptible to entanglement with predatory financial product. So I, I respect the fact that you're clear-eyed about the benefits of a cashless business model, and I will concede those benefits. Those benefits are real. But I hope that you could be equally clear-eyed about the barriers that low-income New Yorkers face to accessing credit and debit. Um, and that's, yeah, that's, I have no questions. That's my comment. I guess I just have one question. When, when a consumer walks into your restaurant and uh, sits down, are they alerted or informed that it's a cashless restaurant? 
our restaurants, we have signage as well. Sorry. Can you? There, there is signage by the front door and by the register. Okay. And what what happens if someone sits down and doesn't uh, isn't aware, uh, but at the end of the day receives their meal and the bill comes? What happens? We are a um, fast casual restaurant, so we don't do table service. All of our service is counter service. However, if anybody gets, you know, waits in line, gets up to the register, orders, and they're real, uh, they by any chance they didn't see the cashless signage, they do not have cash on them, then we empower our managers to make the appropriate decisions and comp those meals and not turn anybody away that has and was not aware of the policy and would like to dine with us. Wow. Any other policy? Any other policy? Yeah, we give the meal in the house. Yeah, we, we have the same policy. Okay. Absolutely. Can I, can I ask, um, before you move to a cashless business model, or those of you that did, wh what percentage of your customers were, were making cash payments? Do you have, do you recall the data? 10%. About 10%? Yes. Ours were about 9 to 10% as Nine well. 9 to 10%? Okay. Interesting. Okay. Great. Thank you. Uh, last panelist. Last panelist, we have Zev Yerman. Hi there. I'm not from any business. I'd just like to give a real life situation. Uh, it's happened to me several times. First of all, my, my credit is, I'm on, a, I'm on a tight budget, so I generally try to stay away from, you know, cards and stuff like that, and I carry cash with me. And a, uh, I walked into, uh, I'll just give you a, situ a couple situations. I walked into a salad store where they make salads. It was on Court Street in Brooklyn. And I saw a nice, nice, the guy was making my salads, but it must have been 15 minutes on it. And they, uh, I walk up to the, uh, you know, I guess I call it a cashier or whatever, and he said, give me uh, $15. I take out $15. and said, no, no, you have, to, you have to pay it in a credit card. I said, well, I don't have a credit card. I have cash here. He said, well, I can't give it to you. So this lady was saying she makes amends if someone has cash. For me, they didn't do that. But I'll tell you another situation happened to me. I walked into Grand Central the other day, uh, through the main entrance, and I was hungry, and I was thirsty, I had a hard day, and I see a big, enormous food court. It's called the Great Northern Food Court, and there's lots of little stands there where you can get foods. You think, wow, all these different business people got together, they put up different stands, and every single one of them is cashless. Finally, I get to the last one in line, and they, uh, all the way at the end, I want to get some potato chips, and the chef there gave me a, the cook gave me a big argument over, over the whole thing, and we went back and forth. Anyway, but then I wanted, uh, that, uh, th I, I then walked away from the place. I walked all the way to the bookstore, and the entire crew there followed me, and they started harassing me. But that's a different story. It's a police matter. But I started investigating there, and I found out that every single one of those individual stands, their food stands, is owned by the same person. And his name is Klaus Mayer. He's from Denmark. And uh, he has all these restaurants and food stands all over the city, which are, which are cashless. So. That's a real world, real, a real world situation there. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you. All right, with, with that said, uh, this hearing is adjourned.